We're back online. Um, so we have Jimmy Rogers here, and now we want to speak to him about, you know, this is a community piece. House of Hoops is is your is part of your community now. So, and basketball is such an important and integral part of this community. So, having Jimmy on board, supporting Jimmy, being a part of you know the the, the top cats is really important for us. And I feel that this is a, a great chance to ask a few questions. So, Jimmy, why Brixton? Like, why is it so important? to basketball for the UK and London? Uh, I came down to London, to Brixton from Liverpool in 1980 and I joined the Crystal Palace club which was, a very, was the most successful club at the time. One of the things that shocked me was the lack of opportunities for young people in inner cities to play basketball. It just didn't Crystal Palace didn't have me in the city kids. So I decided with a couple of colleagues to start a team in a club in Brixton. And by 1984 we entered the league. And uh, in those days it was, it was astonishing. We used to have um, training was the same as now with the young ones, six or eight, and then eight or ten, you had the women on one side, the men on the other. And then in the following week, the boys, the men would be on that side, and the, the seniors on the other. And we used to get 200 people come to training. We had every young person, black, white, male, female, talented, not so talented, came to Brixton. So the, the success was immediate in terms of talent and ability. Uh, that's how we started. That's how we started. Could you compare the Brixton success to the rest of the country? Sorry? Could you compare the Brixton success the rest of the country? Well, it was also a time when there'd been some inner city turmoils, uh, disturbances, riots, call it what you like, mm -hmm. throughout the country. One of the most well known, well documented was Brixton. So I was, I came from an area similar to Brixton, Toxteth, which had a similar negative attitude towards it. And it seemed to be, and I just seemed to think it was ironic. Coming to London and listening to people talking about Brixton, this was 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Oh, you can't go to Brixton, it's blah, 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 blah. I couldn't understand it. So that was that one of our primary objectives, to change that negative attitude about Brixton. And players that have come from Brixton, now, what, what people may not realize is that there, it, it wasn't, it's not just one or two players that have come from Brixton. Could you talk to us a little bit about, you know, the players? Well, it's interesting. Um, there were three things happened to me in 1985. Um, those who know me know I go to the final four every year. In 1985, I went, three things happened. On the same day, Marvin Gaye died. I drove in a white limousine with arguably the most famous basketball coach ever, Johnny Wooden from USL, UCLA. And I also met Michael Jordan by chance, quite by chance, because the people who took me with, uh, in the white, obviously they had Michael Jordan came to see them, long story. Yeah. <laughs> so when Michael Jordan came, he, 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 he said, oh, I've never been to England, I've never been to England. And he wasn't anywhere near as famous as he was going to be. He was very, very popular in college basketball. And America was beginning to, there's nowhere near the global phenomenon phenomen he became. But he promised me he would come if he ever came to England, and a year later he came, massive press down in Brixton. It was all negative, because they said, what do you feel about being in Brixton? And he said, in the next 20 years, there will be a player from here who goes in the NBA. And he was nearly right to the day, Lua Leng. Look at that. Um, but one of the things that happened, the only person in here who was around at that time, as far as I know, is a young man, he's not so young now, who I'd heard about with his twin brother. He's one of 13, living in East London. And I went to see him, I was impressed with his, his whole persona, he and his brother. And they'd been told, they were very small, he's still very small. They were told they were too small to play basketball. He'd been told, from, he was from the age of seven, he was too small to play basketball but they never quit and they came to play with me at 14 
at 15, either of them could have started for the men, and they were and they were starring. Uh, he's Ronnie Baker over here now, Ronnie Baker. And Ronnie Baker retired from England how many years ago? Eight? About eight years ago. The most cat player in the history of English basketball. Too small. Round of applause for that. Now, I, I don't know why, I don't know why, but we've never, ever been blessed with the big boys. Never. Mm. Never, since time we started, we've never ever seemed to attract the really big guys. Never. So we've had to develop a philosophy to combat that, to do with our size, small, which was quickness, and she's very attractive, and the kids don't like it because you have to work hard, but that's, you know, that's, so that's what it came about. Okay. Did you see Jordan again today? I've seen him a few times again, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. From me, you know, what could we learn from him? What did I learn from yeah. Um, what could we learn from him? You know, he's the greatest player of all time. What could we, you know, what did he, what, what could we learn from his, you know, from what he's been doing? His resolute, his, his, his competitiveness, his, his, you can't do this. He would never accept can't, never, never, never. Phenomenal, phenomenal. <laughs> but also we're really, and I had a lot of time for Brixton, a lot of, lot of time for Brixton, a lot of time. And all of Jimmy's players here, did you, did you know that he's friends with Michael Jordan? <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm sure that story's come out a couple of times. No, no, no. I, don't, I don't know. Has anyone heard it before? <laughs> yeah. You have, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then we got um, just out of out of incident because he's the third Mark. generation now. His father was the first person I told to play basketball. His father in Liverpool. Marvin Ambrosius. Marvin, that was oh. uh, Paul Ambrosius. Okay. His son ended up the highest point scorer in the junior as a junior for that team. He was playing for the men at 15 and playing well, Marvin. When Michael Jordan came in 86, a photograph was all over the front or the back, back page of uh, the standard with Marvin like this, holding Marvin like this. Is that right? Jordan yeah. was holding you right. Yeah. yeah. And, if any, and if any of the family, if you look it up, if you look it up in live your way, Google it up. If you see Marvin, when he was, you'll see Sky. It's a spitting image of his, 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 his own son, Sky. The spitting image. <laughs> it gets better. Basketball's a great, it's a great, great family. His father, as I said, Mar Paul Ambrosius, his idol was the, the fella before Michael Jordan, a guy called Julius Irvin, whose nickname was Dr. J. Dr. He had a big afro. And he was the Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. Right. He had the most huge hands I've ever seen in my life. And he could do all sorts with the ball and dunk in it. His daughter, his sister, is now a music superstar in the United States, managed by Dr. J's brother, Dr. J's son. Today, amazing life, all through basketball. For those that don't know, that's Martin Brosius and Fellow Troops. Yeah, 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 yeah Martin Brosius. So, love that. Well, look, so as a, we're going to kind of, before we, uh, if anybody's going to have any questions, but I'm going to just ask one more question. Do you have any advice for aspiring basketball players? Because it's, you know, I've played the game. Um, Me too. And, uh, <laughs> and I know. It's funny, what, what is funny? Uh, what's actually I know the benefits of playing basketball. Not just, of course, not just on the court, but off the court, but what, and the discipline it gives. But what advice would you give to aspiring ballers? Because we know it's difficult to play basketball in, in, you know, over here, to take it to the next level. I think, I don't think I know. I think, first of all, most importantly, you've got to love it. You've got to love it because sometimes you've got to face your own parents who don't understand. You've got to face teachers who don't understand, PE teachers who don't understand. You've got to face your own coaching staff who maybe don't understand or dis differ from you. If, you're the, if you want to become a good player, you're going to go and play all over the place. And sometimes the coach, it doesn't fit for you. If you love it, it doesn't matter. It, it didn't matter for him. It didn't matter for, for Marvin. Yeah, I'm doing it. I'm, you know, I do it. Um, so you've got to really, really have a passion for it. You've got to have a passion for it. If you've got a passion for it, you can deal with those obstacles, you can deal with those negatives, and you can do it. Amazing. Please round of applause for Gerard. 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 Gerard.
open up the floor. Think about your questions. Think about it. Yeah, please. Does anybody have any questions that want to ask anyone on on air? <laughs> Jimmy, uh, can you share your best uh, Luol Deng story from when he was young? Yeah, this is a good one, interesting story. Those of you who know South London, at the time we weren't in the wreck on the, on the summer holidays. We were at a place called, at a school called Bishop Thomas Grant. Yeah, Bishop Thomas Grant, which is about four miles away from here in Streatham. And the first day this particularly, uh, Deng was 10, 11. He was 11. He was 11 years of, no, 11 years of age, yes. And he showed up late. He was never late. He was just never, never late. And I can assure you, I've, I've people heard this. Ronnie will vouch for this. Deng was not the most talented kid we had here. He was not the most talented basketball player we had here. But he worked the hardest. He worked the hardest. Now he turned up late the first day and I, I was so shocked. He's never late. So I said, Michael, as he was known then, Michael said, why, why, why are you late? He said, oh, I've lost my pass. I said, you know, 13 children, well, he had 12 children, 13, 13 brothers and siblings or whatever. I said, I'll, he said, no, I'll be okay. Now, that particular, that was in the summer, that particular Easter, and his birthday's on the 4th of April, by the way, my, uh, the old age birthday on the 4th. I bought a heavy rope, the first heavy rope back, and I gave it to him. And uh, so anyway, he came, he came to camp, all through the camp, nothing, nothing, nothing. Years later, he's in the NBA. <coughs> And he came into Bricks and he started talking, and I didn't know this story. And he told everyone about the day he came late and Jimmy had offered to buy, buy his ticket for the month, and he said no. He ran from South Norwood to Bishop, to Bishop Thomas Grant, four miles and back every day with a 20 pound weighted jacket on his. Wow. You know, I've suggested to some of our older kids running from home, and they look at me like I'm mental. <laughs> <laughs> they look at me like I'm stupid, but you know, that's why he's in the NBA. Yeah. yeah. I woulda, I coulda, I shoulda, but that didn't it. <laughs> yeah. and, and when you were, uh, you know, with Luau, did you, did you know immediately that he was a star? No, my colleague did, Jabbar, he did. My colleague did, he straight away. His brother was more talented, as an example. His brother was taller and more talented. But you know, he got presented with a, a statue when he left university, a bone idol. <laughs> no, no, that's a bit too unfair. But he, was, he didn't have the work ethic of his brother. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, just to get everybody back awake again as well, so like, just in case we're all here, I'm going to ask, we're going to do a little... Did I ask you a question, won't you? You did not ask me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you see um, more British players going to the NBA and why aren't there? There more is there? Well, it is, not enough, it is difficult. Enough. I mean, in the states, you've got you've got any number of uh, courts to go and play. Mm. The weather's not conducive to it here. Um, you know, some of the older kids, or even some of the younger ones. I mean, uh, the younger ones, they, the staff at where we play right. complain that they're coming early. Mm. Believe it or not, mm. complain about them coming early. You would think they'd welcome that. You know. So it is very, it's very difficult. But I say, if you love it, no problem. If you love it, if you love it, and you say, right, I'm going to go for it, you can do it. Definitely. Deng is a perfect example. Perfect example. You can do it. Would you say the gap between the, the states and their level of play and the European play has it's very close now? Because it used to be massive. I think it's I think it's 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 narrow at the top. The professional level, the European, Spanish league, yeah. Italian league, German league, etc. They're excellent. Um, the problem is in the States, they've got all these ridiculous athletes. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of them are athletes. They're not good basketball players, they're good athletes. So, you know. Yeah, hard work and strength. Sure. It's most of it. Yeah. It's generally most of it. Mm. Talent is, is useful, but brawn and just commitment. And the kids are hyped up a bit too early. Yeah. I, I, you understand that because yeah. all that GM's out there. <laughs>